All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 13, and it starts out in verse 1 saying, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, and of course, that's where the story goes from there. So, you know, this is taking place very early on in his reign. And of course, we just read the ending there, how quickly, you know, the, the, his reign ended. You know, he started out really well, but some things happened in this chapter, and we'll see what that is here coming up that caused him to lose uh, control over the kingdom very quickly. Now, it says there that he reigned there uh, one year, and then it says he reigned two over, over, over Israel two years. Now, why does it state it like that? Well, I think it gives you the sense that, you know, he's not, he w he's not really doing anything with, this, with the fact that he's reigning. You know, he's, he's reigned one year, and nothing really eventful happens. He's just kind of being the king, just kind of, you know, this is the impression that I get. And then it says, and when he had reigned two years over, it, over Israel, you know, now finally something is starting to happen. And it says there in verse 2, it says, that Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. So it seems like now he's kind of getting the troops together, although not many, I mean only 3,000. He's only keeping 2,000 for himself. He's sending another 1,000 uh, with Jonathan. But it just kind of seems like, you know, he's not really getting the ball rolling. And what I'm referring to is the fact that, you know, the Philistines are at this time oppressing Israel. I mean, they are in the heart of Israel. They're coming in freely. And we'll see that here in a minute. But, you know, these first two years of Saul's reign, he's just kind of seems like he's just kind of taking it easy. Just kind of, you know, uh, you know, resting on his laurels. Just kind of be getting comfortable in the position. I believe that is the beginning of Saul's downfall. Is that he just kind of got, you know got kind of lazy. He wanted to just start kind of taking it easy. You know, he got the kingship. He's, he's a, you know, he's in that position. And, you know, a lot of times it's really easy when you get in a position to just kind of take things, take it easy. You know, we could apply this to a church. You know, sometimes a church can, uh, you know, reach a certain level of works. It can reach a certain level, you know, of preaching and doing great things for God. But if it's not careful, you know, one year goes by and then two years go by and it's like, well, what are you guys doing? Well, we're not doing much anything. You know, this happens a lot, you know, even with, you know, we could apply it to just Christians themselves. You know, sometimes Christians, you know, they'll start out real strong. You know, they're living for the Lord, they're going soul winning, they're reading their Bibles, they're praying. You know, they love the preaching of the Word of God. But after time, and it's typically, you know, it is that two-year period. You know, it's like that first two years of, of being saved are like the most exciting times, you know, especially if you're plugged into a good church. But, you know, after time, you could kind of turn into a saw a little bit, where it's just kind of like, well, I'm just going to coast, take it easy. And just see, see how things go. And then, of course, you read in verse 3, it says, And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. So his eldest son, Jonathan, shows up and says, Well, I'm glad you're king, Dad, but let's get something done. You know, and sometimes that's what a church needs. It needs some young blood to come in there and fire people up and get them excited about, you know, taking on the Philistines, doing a work for God. You know, and sometimes we as Christians, when, as we grow older as Christians, we need that too. You know, if we ever, you know, sometimes we'll run into a younger Christian who has this zeal and has this love for God and his word. You know, and I've seen some Christians kind of, oh, you know, they get, they kind of, they almost don't like that because it reminds them that they're kind of like a Saul, that they've just kind of been, you know, on the, resting on their laurels, taking it easy. And then you have this Jonathan show up and he's like, well, let's do something. You know, I know I've only got a thousand guys and you've got two thousand guys, Saul. You know, Saul, why isn't Saul, you know, the one, you know, uh, kickstarting this thing and getting this thing going. I mean, he's got twice as many people as Jonathan, you know, but, but he's the guy that's in the position. He's the guy that's just kind of taking it easy, just kind of enjoying, you know, the, the, the position that he's attained. But, you know, Jonathan comes along, that younger Christian, you know, who might not have as much, might not have as many resources, but what does he have? He has the zeal to go out and do something big for God. It says there, and Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines, uh, and, and it says that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. So, you know, here's another lesson. When you go out to do something big for God, you know, the enemy is going to hear about it. You know, don't think you're going to go make waves in the world and win a bunch of souls and preach a bunch of red-hot sermons without waking up the enemy, without the enemy hearing about it. And don't think that the enemy is just going to hear about it and do nothing about it. They're going to do something about it. Now, of course, you know, uh, I I earlier in, in chapter, uh, I believe it was chapter 10, maybe it was chapter, it was chapter 11, you know, Nahash the Ammonite, you know, but he came up and, you know, and Saul squashed him pretty quick, right? He took care of that. He took care of business. But here's the thing. Nahash the Ammonite was kind of small potatoes. You know, he wasn't like the Philistines here. 
The Philistines are at this time this great, powerful nation. They're not, you know, the, the, the Amalekites that are just kind of squeaking in there trying to, you know, mix things up. And it says there that the Philistines heard of it and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. So you can kind of see again, you know, how Jonathan kind of gets the thing going. And then Saul's like, all right, well, let me blow the trumpet. You know, this young whippersnapper is coming along and he's calling me out for, you know, not doing what I need to do. And here's the thing, you know, I, I hear about it sometimes, uh, you know, through email and things like that. Or you know, people that, you know, that, that get on fire for God, they get saved through maybe like a YouTube ministry like Pastor Anderson has or somebody's video or something like that. They, they hear the preaching of the word of God. They get saved. They get on fire for the Lord. And they say, man, and then they hear, you know, not only should you be saved, but you should also join a church and be faithful to church and go soul winning. So they find a, you know, a King James Bible church. They go to a soul winning Baptist church and they go in there and the place is dead as a doornail. And they go in there and they want to do something big for God. You know, would to God that the people that were in that church, the pastor and others, were like Saul. That when Jonathan came along, that he would be like, all right, let me blow the trumpet and let's go to war. Let's get something done here. We got some fresh blood. But what often happens, unfortunately, is that people go into these churches and, and, and instead of getting right and doing right, you know, the Saul's in there, the, the older Christians, the pastors that have just kind of been taking it easy, a few years have gone by, they haven't really done anything for God in a while. What they do is they end up just trying to chase Jonathan off and just say, oh, you listen to Pastor Anderson? Well, you need to just get out of here. You know, and I'm not saying that there aren't people that go in there and we can't control, you know, all the idiots out there <laughs> that want to just, you know, latch onto the preaching and then just have no discernment or no, you know, uh, uh, you know, no tact when they go into these churches. But there's a lot of people out there that, that do listen to the sermons and want to be a blessing and go in there and serve God. But unfortunately, you know, the Saul's aren't there blowing the trumpet. You know, they're just trying to run everybody out. And that happens. Would to God they'd be like Saul. They'd say, hey, man, you know, I know I've been kind of taken it easy. You're right. You know, our glory days are kind of behind us, but hey, if we got some fresh blood coming in, you know, and that's one thing that, you know, a lot of these Pastor Anderson, you know, this, you know, this church is a great example of it. There's a lot of people that heard about Pastor Anderson online, and here they are. You know, they're here in this church, and you know what? They come, it's like they come ready-made. They're already, they already understand basic doctrine. You know, they're saved. They want to go soul winning. They understand church attendance. I mean, you don't even have to preach on tithing. They just start tithing. You know, it's like they're ready-made church members. And they're these Jonathans. They might not have 2,000, but they got 1,000, and they're ready to do something for God. You know, and, you know, these, wish these pastors would be more like Saul, that they would, they would see what they have, and that they would blow the trumpet, and they would do something big for God. But why don't they? Because they know if they blow that trumpet, they know if they try to do something big for God, the enemy's going to hear about it. You know, or maybe, you know, their, their circle of, you know, fellow Bible college preachers that they all graduated with, they're going to hear that, oh, you've got Andersonites in your church? You know, the enemy, they're going to be found out, and, and they run and hide, just like we see in this chapter. <laughs> but he says here that Jonathan smote the garrison. You know, he's getting this, the, the thing going. And he's, and he's trying to do something big for God. He's kind of dragging dad along here. And Saul blows the trumpet and said, let all the Hebrews hear, of the, and the, uh, uh, all the land saying, let all the Hebrews hear, excuse me. And it says in verse 4, and all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison. You know, and this is just a, real quick. This is a great example of what Pastor Anderson preached about on Sunday night about indirect action. Did everybody listen to that sermon? It was a really good sermon. I think everyone should listen to that because, you know, it helps with Bible interpretation how to, and so you don't get mixed up on bad doctrine. But, you know, Israel heard that Saul had smitten a garrison. Now, who smote the garrison? It was Jonathan. Yeah. But, you know, Saul was the one that blew the trumpet, you know, and, and Jonathan was acting under Saul's authority. So you could just as easily say that Saul had done it. Anyway, I don't want to re-preach his sermon. But it says here that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. So they hear the great news. They hear that, hey, you know, Saul's making some moves. Saul's doing some big things. But then they also hear that the Philistines, that they're had an abomination with the Philistines. The Philistines have found out, and they're not happy about it. Look, if you go take, the, take on the enemy, the enemy's not just going to roll over for you. They're going to fight back. They're going to hold you in abomination. You know, we get up and we preach against the queers and the homos and the faggots. We preach against all the feminism and all the liberalism that's you know, creeping into churches and overtaking our society, we get up as preachers and just rail on it and rip, and everyone says, amen, but don't be surprised when you get some pushback. True. When your family finds out, oh, you listen to that preacher? Right. Right. And they hold you in abomination for being associated with a church like this. True. Or when the news media finds out and says, oh, did you hear this sermon that this pastor preached about how homosexuals should be put to death, according to the Bible, according to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13? 
and then they show up, you know, and they, they hold you in abomination. Don't be surprised that if you're going to do something big for God, that if you're going to try to actually live for the Lord and take a stand and do something and push back against the enemy, and we need that today. We need people that are willing to stand up and preach the whole counsel of the Word of God and to push back against all the, the sin and iniquity and the filth that's just overrunning our land. I mean, the Philistines are just all over Israel right now. You know, and we're in a similar predicament in this country. You know, spiritually speaking, there's a bunch of spiritual Philistines that have just infested this land and are filling it up with all kinds of wicked abomination. And, and it's just like, where are the preachers that are crying out against it? Where are the Saul's? Where is the Saul that has the 2,000 men, that has the Bible college, that's just cranking out graduates left and right? Where are these guys? Why aren't they taking a stand? Why is, it, why is it Jonathan? Why is it just this young blood with a few thousand people that has to be the loudest voice and try to get people going? We need some, you know, we need some people to blow that trumpet and to not be afraid of the pushback that's going to come. Because pushback will come. And said Israel was had an all abomination with the Philistine and the people uh, were, were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. You know, then we're going to go have a peace treaty. Then we're going to go and talk things out. This wasn't a United Nations meeting. This wasn't, you know, some ecumenical thing where they're going to sit down and just talk about their differences. Philistines came to fight. And that's what I'm saying. If, you know, if we stand up and preach the word of God, mark it down. The enemy's going to come and the enemy's going to want to fight. You know what I say? Bring it on. Let's fight. I'm, I, I'm, I'm like John. I love Jonathan's attitude. He's spoiling for it. you. Get into chapter 14. He's doing it again. He's going after another garrison. I mean, he's just he's all over the place. He said, "Let's do something big for God." He wants to get something done. I love that attitude. But too, unfortunately, we have too many Sauls who just want to sit back and let the years go by, and have no, and it just so that there's no, you know, don't want to rock the boat. You know, the Philistines are. We'll just pray tribute. We'll just go along to get along. Everything will be fine. No. What we need are some Jonathans, people who are going to get up and do something for God, who aren't afraid of a fight. <laughs> so he calls them all together, and the Philistines show up. They're fixing for a fight. And then look at verse 5. And here's the reason why so many people don't want to fight the enemy today. Here's the reason why you know, all, these, all these Baptist churches just want to bow the knee to Baal to just, you know, and, and just kiss the, the big toe of you know, the liberal media and everybody else is because they're outnumbered. And they are. And mark it down. We are outnumbered today. I mean, look at verse 5. He says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000. Now, how many men does Saul have? 3,000. <laughs> I mean, do the math on that. He shows up with 30,000. He's got, what, how many, what is that? 10,000 times more people? Is that right? Is that math right? You know, I can't use my phone right now. It's recording. 10, 10 times, right. 10 times more people. And 6,000 6, horsemen. You know, it's not enough that he's just got the chariots. He's got the horsemen, too. You know, that's the way it is today. You know, it's, not, it's bad enough that, the, you know, all the, all the liberal, you know, the homos and everybody else out there, all the God-haters, and that's what they are, God-haters. They hate God. They hate His Word. They hate the man of God. They hate the people of God. They want to oppress and silence and shut the man of God up and tell him to back down and quit preaching that Bible. They hate the Bible. You know, it's bad enough that those people, you know, they've got their chariots. Yeah. You know, they've got the, the liberal media in their back pocket. They've got every news organization. I mean, they've just got, you know, e even, even the so-called conservative stuff. Right. They're, all, they're, all they're all saying, oh, let's just get along. Oh, Trump, he's our, our conservative hero, right? I mean, he's all, he's all about the homos. Yep. He's all for the abortion, just like the rest of them. He's just as wicked and, and corrupt as all of them. And here's the thing, the enemy, they have a lot of resources, don't they? Yeah. You know, these God-haters, these spiritual Philistines, they have 30,000 chariots today. But on top of that, they've also got 6,000 horsemen. You know, it's bad enough they got the media, they got control of the government too. There's wickedness in high places today. Yeah. You know, they're, they're up in D.C., they're, in every, they're on every level of government, right down to the local level. You have these sodomites, because that's how they fight. That's how they fight their agenda. They get policies on their side. You know what? You can make any law you want. You can make any policy you want. I'm not going to stop preaching this book. Amen. I'm going to preach every word of it. And you want to say, oh, it's illegal. You want to turn us into Canada and tell us it's illegal to preach certain passages. I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. Go ahead and lock me up for it. I'll, I'll gladly go. You know, I'll probably get a raise. <laughs> My boss will be like, good job. You know, keep it up. 
What? You got arrested for preaching the word of God? That way to take initiative, Corbin. And that's what I'm saying. That's what we need today. But so many people, they want to run and hide because they're outnumbered. But we already understand that. And this really shouldn't come as a surprise to us that we are outnumbered. Just as Saul was back then, so are we today. We are outnumbered. Go over to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. It says he had all these horsemen, these chariots, and he had people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude which came up and pitched in Michmash eastward in Bethlehem. I mean, they're in their backyard. And there's just, and, and not only is it the chariots and it's the, you know, the, the horsemen, but he's just got so many footmen you can't even count them. It's like looking at the sand in the seashore. Just this huge, just a mass of people. Look, they were outnumbered. <laughs> 3,000 people or whatever it was. I mean, hey, that's the boat we're in. There's no new thing under the sun. We're in the same position. But here's what I'm trying to say is that that should not stop us and that should not surprise us. Don't let, don't let the fact that we're outnumbered today surprise us because spiritually speaking, we're not outnumbered. But of course, you know, when we just look through the eyes of the flesh and just look at the situation that it is in the world, in the physical world, yeah, there's, it seems like there's a lot more of them. At least they have a lot more power. You know, there's a lot more people out there that, that, that can actually do things. They have, you know, they have the, the horse spin and they have, you know, the, the, uh, the, the chariots. I mean, I, I already, I had to turn already, but remember how that's, this chapter ended. It said there, um, well, I got to go back there real quick. They, not only did they have them outnumbered, they had them outgunned. If you recall there, it said, it, it said that, uh, that they didn't even have, um, where is it? The Coulters. The Coulters, yeah. 21. 21, thank you. It says in 21, yet they, well, back it up. It says in uh, verse 19, and there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. I mean, they're completely disarmed. You know, of course, you can't read this passage without talking about the obvious thing about gun control. Right. You know, that's one thing. Another thing these commies would love to do in this country right. is to take all your guns away. Oh, you're just, you're just a, you know, you know you're a Bible-clutching, God-fearing, you know, gun-toting uh, American. Yes, I am. Amen. I intend to stay that way. Oh. <laughs> but that, because here's what the enemy loves to do. You know, they love to take away your guns. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them, sell, make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. They had to actually go to the enemy, to the Philistines, to get all their tools sharpened, for all their gardening tools or whatever, for do the agricultural work that they had to do. They had to go there. You know, and that's, that's kind of like what, what the, uh, you know, the, 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 these liberals and these God-haters have done to a lot of Christians today. You know, they just neutered them spiritually. They've just made them have to, you know, they're, they're like, you can go ahead and have your land. You know, you can have your, your church and you can have your congregation and you can go ahead and preach what, you know, preach, but you're only going to preach so much. You know, and by the way, we're going to take that King James out of your hand and we're going to give you, you know, this weak, you know, gardening tool. We're going to take the sharp two-edged sword out of your hand you know, and give you the, the, the goad of the NIV. We're going to go give you the, the coulter of the ESV or something like that. That's what they want to do. That's what the enemy wants to do to us. They want to stop us, shut us up, and they, they want to take the weapon of the Word of God. Yeah, obviously, we could talk about the gun control, and that's important. But you know what's more important than that is making sure you still have the Word of God in your hand. I mean, if you came down to me and said, hey, you can have a gun or you can have the Bible, I'd take the Bible. Because this tells me that no thing formed against me shall prosper. This is all the defense I need. This is the spiritual weapon that we need to have today. And they want to take it out of our hands and they want to outnumber us. And in, you know, in a lot of ways they do and they are more powerful. You know, physically speaking in this world, they have more advantage than we do. You know, we can hardly stay on YouTube anymore. Right. <laughs> we got to make all these multiple alternate channels, build them up. And I guarantee you we can build them up just so YouTube can knock them down again. Yeah. But you know what? We'll keep right on doing it. Yep. Keeps putting the message out there. But, you know, we're outnumbered today, but that shouldn't surprise us. And more importantly, that should not stop us. Okay? Don't let it surprise you. Where did I have you go? to uh, Luke? Luke chapter uh, 13, right? Verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive in that straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So the answer was, yeah. In fact, there are few that are saved. And then you spread that out over all the course of, you know, of history, of mankind. You know, <laughs> it's not a lot of people. You know, we're not exactly, you know, you know, packing out the house here, you know. I mean, we, I would to God that we, would, we were and we will one day. We'll have more people. People keep coming. The church is growing. It's great. But, you know, I'm not holding my breath to be running like the mega church. 
You know, I'm not holding my breath thinking about the day. You know, it's going to be great when we're running the numbers that Joel olstein has got. It's not going to happen. I mean, it could. It's, there's nothing to stop it. But, you know, realistically, think, I mean, realistically, if that happened, I'd be shocked. Because people, you know, in, in the last times, you know, they're going to turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're going to want to hear lies and, and they're going to want to hear just nice, soft, you know, Joel Olstein messages. And that's what they get. That's what they want. And they'll pay for it. <laughs> they'll, 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 you, know, you can buy a ticket to go there. Hey, it's free admission here. Come on in. Right? <laughs> go over to Luke chapter 12. Look, we're outnumbered. But that shouldn't surprise us. We're outnumbered, and that shouldn't stop us from doing the work of God. We need to be like Jonathan and not just, you know, look at the, the numbers and go, well, what's the point? Let's just try to get along and just stay off the radar and not make any waves and, and just eke out an existence here in this life. No, let's be like a Jonathan. Let's not be surprised. Let's not be taken aback by these numbers. Luke chapter 12, look at verse uh, 32. He said, fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. Even Jesus called us little. He said, you're little. He doesn't say, and look, it's not, be, it's not talking about physical <laughs> stature here. There's some big boys in this church, okay? <laughs> He's talking about the fact, you know, numerically speaking, we are little compared to the world. Just like Saul and Jonathan. You know, they had a few thousand, but they, you know, the Philistines had many thousands and they had, you know, much stronger weapons. Go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. He said, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Look, who's going to give us the kingdom? The Father, the Lord. The Lord God is going to give it. He's the one that's fighting. That's our secret weapon. Amen. That's what these Philistines don't realize. Right. They, they just look at us. They just look at, you know, you know, they look at me. They just, you know, who, whatever man of God, they look at you just out knocking doors. And they say, oh, that's pathetic. They're weak. And you know what? That's the truth, too. But God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are strong. Amen. The base things. To confound the things which are mighty. God has ch chosen the base things of the world. The weak yeah. things of the world. So that he would get the glory. You know, and the Philistines can look at us and they can just say, oh, they're nothing. And you know what? They're right. But what they forget is that we have a secret weapon. Yeah. It's called the Lord God. Yeah. It is the, our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. We might be little, but you better, you better not mess with my daddy. <laughs> kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like kids used to argue. You know, they don't, you ever get in that argument with their kid? My dad can beat up your dad. Who's, whoever, did, whoever had that conversation with their kid? Am I the only one who got one other one? You know, and then the trump card was, my dad's got a gun, you know. <laughs> my, da my dad fought in Nam or whatever, you know. <laughs> anyway, but that's how we are with the world. You know, they, we can bicker back and forth with them. But at the end of the day, we've got the bigger dad. Amen. We've got the stronger dad. We've got a dad that's got a whole arsenal. Right. You know, he's the dad that's, you know, he's the prepper dad. It's got the basement full of beans and bullets, right? Where'd I have you go? Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13, look at verse 4. It says, And they worshipped the dragon and gave the power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Look, this is what's going to happen. This is down the road. When the, the beast and the Antichrist and the false prophet, at the, you know, the, the last days before Christ returns, the beast is going to rise up. And it says in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle on them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over him, was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. The lamb is slain from the foundation of the year of the, of the world. Excuse me. So he, what is he saying here? Look, there's coming a time where we shouldn't be surprised, little flock, when that when this when this all this stuff starts to unfold, we're going to be outnumbered. We're going to be outgunned, just like Saul and Jonathan. And you know what? We will even be overcome. Who is able to stand against the beast? Nobody. You know that's why it's so stupid to sit here and think like, well, what am I going to do? You know, if we go through the tribulation, you know, I've got I've got this backup plan. You know, you're buying generators and canned food and bullets and water filtration systems and everything else, and people are just prepping to go hide. That's not what I'm going to do. It's pointless. There's no hiding from people that have, you know, infrared vision and heat seeking and everything else. I mean, it's just like, you really think you're going to hide? Or they're going to think, well, we're going to fight back. It's like, it's like you taking that coulter or that, you know, that little axe and just trying to go up against a chariot. Ting, ting, ting. 
You know, it's like these guys that want to fight the government, you know, and, and they're going to, they got these, got, they got these rifles. You know, that rifle you have is like a pea shooter compared to what they have, you know, and, and they're not ever going to let you have what you, what they have. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I mean, you just say bang, bang, bang. They're up there just, you know, you don't stand a chance, right? Who's going to make war with the beast? Nobody. And he's going to, it says right there that it was given unto him to overcome them. You know, he said, and Jesus said in Matthew 24, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. The only thing, the only way you're going to make it out of there is if you live until Jesus comes. And then he'll snatch you out of there. But it's not going to be the power of your own strength. And you know who God's going to protect and, and allow him to, uh, to survive unto his coming? The people that are serving him. Not the people that are hiding out in the bush. The people that are running off like in, in Saul's day, going to the rocks and the caves and the deserts and just trying to hide from the Antichrist. It's the people that are going to be like Jonathan that are going to say, let's go do something big for God that are preaching the gospel, putting themselves out there. It's like I preached the other day. God only protects people who put themselves in harm's way. There's no sense in trying to protect somebody who's not going to put themselves in harm's way. I won't re-preach that either, but he says in verse 10, he that, he, uh, it's, you know, the happy ending is, he that leadeth in, uh, into captivity shall go into captivity. You know, the beast is going to be defeated. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. You know, him that's oppressing is going to be oppressed. God's going to, uh, he goes out, he's going to win. He says there, in the, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And he says, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. What is the patience and the, and the faith of the saints that we have today? That God's going to win. That even though we're outnumbered, even though we're outgunned, just like in Saul's day, just like we're going to be one day, and even today, in many ways, we're outnumbered and outgunned, you know, our, 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 our faith is the patience of the, this is the patience and the faith of the saints. Amen. That God is on our side, that ultimately we win, na 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 boo boo, you know, we, we can go ahead and have a victory dance right now. Because we already won. Go over to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And we're not always going to be outnumbered. I mean, look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. He said, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Just like the sands of the seashore, right? Just like Philistines back in, in, in Samuel. No man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the Lamb and bef uh, before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. That's us. Look, you're in that, that story. That's you. You just saw yourself in the future. That's amazing. And you know what? You win. If you're, you know, if you're saved, if you're, if you're on God's side, you win. You know, you're going to be that great multitude one day. It might not seem like it here. It might not seem like it right now. Right now, it seems like we're outnumbered, just like, you know, back in Saul's day. They're going, man, we're, we're outgunned. We're outnumbered. What are we going to do? But you know, if you just be like Jonathan, if you just say, you know what? It doesn't matter. God's on our side. I already know whatever the outcome is. All things are worked together. To good for them that love God, to them that are called according to his purposes. I'm going to go ahead and just serve God anyway. I'm just going to go ahead and preach the word anyway. I'm going to go ahead and just take the stand anyway. You're going to win. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible says, I'll just read you from uh, you know, Revelation 19. It says, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of gr a great multitude and the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Look, let's just start doing that now. Let's just start being glad now. Let's just start rejoicing now. Let's just start giving honor unto God now because the victory is already won. Amen. Look, we might be outnumbered, but that should not surprise us and it definitely should not stop us right. from being like Jonathan, Amen. from going out there and wanting to do something big for God. You know, and I could preach this, you know, and, and we could talk about this. And look, all these other Baptists out there, they have, you know, if they're King James only, they have the same book we have. So why don't they have this attitude? Because they're carnal. Because they want to hang on to a building. Because they don't want to upset people and watch them walk out with their tithe and have to downsize or give up a, a lifestyle that they're accustomed to. You know, they're afraid. They're afraid of the repercussions of preaching the entire counsel of the Word of God. They're like Saul. They just want to take it easy, right? And this is what happens in verse, in verse 6. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, look, we're in a strait. 
betwixt two, <laughs> having a desire to part, you know, and to remain here, which is, you know, be, to depart is far better. But we got work to do down here, like Paul, right? Like he was in a strait. And we're in a strait. And we know that what the, end, the outcome is, but in the meantime, there's a, there's a battle to fight. Yeah. And these guys, these men of Israel, they saw they were in a strait, and for they were distressed, and the people did hide themselves in caves and in the thickets and the rocks and the high places and the pits. I mean, can, what, it's pathetic. I mean, uh, carnally speaking, we can understand because they're so outnumbered in a physical battle. But spiritually speaking, it's pathetic for God's people to act like this. When they already, re when they already read the same verses we just read in Revelation, when they have the exact same Bible that we do, they know the outcome just as well as we do. But you know what? Spiritually, they're in the thickets. You know, just these little reeds trying to hide from the devil. They're in the caves. They're in the high places. They're in the pits. You know, they're wallowing down in the mire. You know, just getting filthy, not even, not even wanting to clean themselves up and do something for God. They're just letting the world walk all over them. They're hiding because they're afraid. And then it says there in verse 7, And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And it says, And he tarried seven days according to the time, uh, set time that Daniel, uh, that, excuse me, the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So what are they doing? They're waiting, right? They're here. You know, these people, people disperse the thousands. They see all the, the, the great multitude of the Philistines coming, and they just take off, and they run and hide. But he's got a few guys, you know, that are following Saul, trembling. They're, you know, they're afraid. They're not sure what's going to happen, but they go with him, and they go to Gilgal, because that's what they were supposed to do. That's what Saul told them to do back in, uh, in, in, in chapter, uh, chapter 10. You know, and you see that time and time again that they're supposed to go to Gilgal and wait for him. <coughs> and it says that they were scattered from him. <coughs> and the people were scattered from him. So he's waiting, right? He's waiting for Saul to show up. And Saul said, bring hither, uh, oh, excuse me, verse 8. And Saul, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that, that Samuel had appointed him. But Sa Samuel came not to Gilgal. So he waits the seven days like he was told to in chapter 10, right? Which, you know, by the way, that's not concurrent with this. Okay, this is, you know, th this 1 Samuel I is in chronological order. You know, I rack my brain about that. And I don't even really want to take too much time to go into that. But, you know, let's just go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Because I already brought it up. Excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 10. You recall in 1 Samuel chapter 10, this is when he first comes to see the seer, first meets Samuel. And he tells him, look, you know, you're going to be the king of Israel. And he's about to send him on his way. And he says in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. So he's telling about all these signs that are going to happen as he journeys back to his home. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. He's saying, look, when you become king, do as occasion serve you, for God is with you. He's saying, look, if you know what to do, go do it. That's what he's saying here. And it's exactly what he did with Nahash the, or, or Nahash the Ammonite. When that happened, he did as occasion served him. There was no real concern there. He just went ahead and took care of business. Okay? And that then he says this. He says, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and I will come unto thee to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry. So, but he's not saying, look, seven days later I'm going to show up from this day. He's not saying at this moment in chapter 10, where he's anointing him and saying, go on your way, he's saying, and seven days from now, I'm going to show up and I'm gonna, we're going to take care of business. I'm going to tell you, because all these other things happen. Remember Nahash the Ammonite, when he came up and he said, and, the, and, he, and they said, uh, the, the men of Jabesh Gilead said, give us seven days respite and we will see if any man will deliver. So there's your seven days right there. Seven days have already gone by. And, you know, chapter, and, and not, not to mention the fact that chapter 13 says he had reigned one year and he reigned two years. So there's, you know, so what he's saying here is, look, do as occasion serve thee. But when there's something you don't, when there's something that's out of your control, you don't know what to do, go to Gilgal, which makes perfect sense because Gilgal is a very significant place. Gilgal is where they first, they put up the 12 stones when they came across Jordan before they took on Jericho. Yeah. When they came out of the wilderness, they crossed over. They pitched in Gilgal that first day. So it's a significant place. And you even see that, you know, after Nahash the Ammonite, at the end of that story, they say they, it says that they went to Gilgal and there they renewed the kingdom and made Saul king and offered peace offerings and, and sacrifices. So what he's saying is, look, whenever you're up against something hard, go wait for me 
and Gilgal and I'll show up and I'll tell you what to do. Now, is he in a hard place here? Yeah, he's got, he's vastly outnumbered. He's got this just huge enemy that's just going to steamroll him. No problem. So he goes to Gilgal and he's waiting, but Samuel doesn't show up. Now, I don't think Samuel was late. I just think Saul was impatient. And that's where people make a lot of mistakes is they become impatient. And what they end up doing is they become, uh, out, they become uh, disobedient. Look, when you're outnumbered, when the, when the, when the, you know, the, when the, well, I don't know what's the expression, when the, when the, st <laughs> the deck stacked against you, I don't know if you're using casino terms around here, but you know what I mean? When, when the odds are against you, that's a gambling one too. Man, you can't get any of these that's clean, that's where's that clean euphemism, that can, or not euphemism, but analogy that I can use? Backs against the wall. When your back's against the wall, when you're in a, between a rock and a hard place, right? right? Amen. You know, that's when you should wait on God right. and not get impatient. You should wait on him. And wait for him to show up and tell you what to do and help you through it. Amen. And you know what? You might have to wait a little longer than you'd like. I mean, we, we, want, it. we want to know the answer now. Right. We want to know right now. God, I've got this problem. What's the answer now? You know, it just might be that God allows that problem to come into your life so that he can get your attention and hold it and actually tell you other things while you're waiting for that answer and teach you other things while you're waiting for an answer on this, on, on whatever this, this, this situation is, so on and so forth. But he says, look, go there. And, he, and, and he, so he goes there and he tarries. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered for, from him. So that's where Saul makes this big mistake of taking matters into his own hands. He takes matters into his own hands in verse 9. It said, Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, which was not his place to do. He was not to do that. But what, what happened is he got impatient. He was outnumbered. You know, his back was up against the wall. Things weren't looking good. And Samuel just took too long for him. And he became impatient. And when, when that happens, often what we do is, instead of waiting on God for a solution, we're waiting on God to show us, you know, what it is that we should do. We take things into our own hands. And look, when we do that, when we take things out of God's hands and say, oh, I got this. Look, you already admitted the problem's too big for you, Saul. But now you're just going to offer these, these sacrifices and take things out of your hands out of God's hands. When we do that, when we take things out of God's hands, nothing good happens. Nothing good happens. You don't get the answer you're looking for. You know, often and nothing really changes. He says in verse 10, and verse 10 is just like a punch in the gut when you read it, right? And he says, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Oh, man, if you just held out a little longer. And you know what? He ha I'm, I'm sure he showed up at the very last minute. I don't think Samuel showed up late. I think he showed up in time. It was just like the seventh day. You know, when the, it was about to become the eighth day. And he just waited it out. And, and, and you know, and Samuel just, or Saul just can't take it. He's, the Philistines are getting closer. Everybody's leaving and running and hiding. The few guys that came with me are scattered. Where is Samuel? Why isn't he here yet? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make the offering. And then right after he's done, you know, just you know, throwing the ashes out, turns around. Oh, there he is. I can't imagine he must have just gone completely white, like, oh, where were you? You know? But you know what? Who's to blame? Saul. Because he's the one that became impatient. He's the one that all he could see was the fact that he was outnumbered, not understanding that the victory was the Lord's, that you know God was in control and that he would deliver him if he would just wait. And that's the attitude we have to have today is that, look, we might be outnumbered, but we know that God's in control. We know that ultimately we're going to win and we just need to wait on the Lord and serve him and do things right. And of course, you know, he goes into verse 11 and Samuel said, what hast thou done? And I love that question because then he gets this, you know, this, this answer. And the answer is just, just the typical just like snowing you. It reminds me of like when a kid gets, when you bust one of your kids, right. when both your kids come in and one's like holding their face crying, hey, she hit me or he hit me or whatever, you know? And it's like, what'd you do? And then the, the one that's guilty gives you this long explanation. Well, first, you know, I was playing with, and then he came in and I told him, don't do that, that he had his toys, but then he came over and took my toy. So, you know, I forced myself and I punched him right in the face. <laughs> It's like, well, I know you punched him right in the face. Why didn't you just get to that? Why didn't you just admit you're wrong? That's what he's saying here. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And, Samuel, and Saul said, 
because I knew that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not, now he's kind of blaming Saul, Saul a little bit, and because thou camest not in the days appointed, right, and the Philistines gathered themselves to Michmash, look, they're right here, they're right in our back door, look, all, look, of course I did what I did, I mean, come on, look what's going on here, Saul, and he said, they gathered themselves to Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication, Lord, I forced myself, therefore, and have offered a burnt offering. So what he's doing here is showing that he had no faith. That he got impatient, he had a lapse in faith, and he took matters into his own hands. And Samuel said in verse 13, well, you know what, that makes perfect sense. You know, I can understand your position. Now that you explain things to me like that, Saul, I, you know what, I, I understand. I'm glad you did that. You know, you made the right move. Is that what he said? He had this big, long excuses that might have sounded good. But Saul, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. He didn't say, oh, I understand, you know. He wasn't sympathetic. He said, look, you messed up, buddy, big time. And thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy, thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Man, Saul was that close. Look, he was one, what did he do? One bad decision. Just like I preached a little while ago. One bad decision is all it took. And he lost everything. And it sounded like a good decision at the time, didn't it? It even made a little bit of sense, car you know, carnally speaking. Well, of course I should do this. You know, this just makes sense. But it cost him everything. And you know what? There's no excuse for him. There's none. He doesn't have any excuses here. Because he, was, he, he should have known that God would deliver him. And he says here in verse 14, But now thy kingdom shall not continue, for the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. Of course, we know the story. He's alluding to David. And, but it says that that man, has a, it, it, he sought him a man after his own heart. Meaning a man who understands the Lord and that is willing to wait on him is going to be obedient and to do what he needs to do and, and not act like, Saul, act like uh, Saul here and be impatient and make brash decisions. You know, that's, that's really what happens in this story is Saul gets real impatient and what does he do? He makes a brash decision just on the fly, on the cuff, just, you know, rolls the dice and you know what? It didn't turn out well for him. And it cost him everything. And he says, look, God has sought him a man after his own heart. Now, we'll see here, you know, in coming up in, 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 the, in the future of this book, that David was put in even worse circumstances than Saul, by Saul himself. I mean, David was outnumbered for a long time. David, you know, thought he was going to die many times. David thought he was never, you know, he, he was up, he was in a rock and a, between a rock and a place. He was had his back up against the wall. But did he act out like Saul? Did he, did he take things into his own hands? And No, in fact, when he had opportunity to, to avenge himself upon Saul, to kill Saul on more than one occasion, he, he said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Right, right. That's what it means that he's a man after the Lord, after, he's after the Lord's, he's a man after God's own heart. Amen. Is that he's one that's willing to just let God stay in control and understand that God's timing is perfect and that God will deliver him. Amen. He's not going to make these foolish, brash decisions like Saul did. That's the difference there. <clears throat> and he said uh, that, that uh, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And you say, well, that's just not fair. You know, and here's the thing. A lot of times in life, you know, God's going to allow things to happen in our life. We're going to find ourselves in positions where we just have to wait on the Lord. We just have to wait on God and let him deal, work with things out and exercise patience. You know, that's one of the biggest, you know, you have need of patience. That's one of the biggest things, uh, biggest virtues that a Christian can have is patience. And, you know, well, you say, well, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem fair that God makes people wait. But what did he say of Christ? You know, that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the, of, of the Father. Amen. You know, and he says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. You know, he says, you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know, sometimes we just need to understand that whatever we're going through, whatever resistance we're going through, whatever trial or temptation we're going through, ask yourself this, have you resisted unto blood? Have you been patient and waited on God to the point of where you're willing to bleed and die for it? I don't think any of us have ever been there. I don't care what the temptation is. You know, none of us has been, had to resist unto blood like Christ. He set the standard. He said, look, look, be like me, resist unto blood. Don't give in to temptation. Be patient, you know, through these trials, through these temptations, and God will see you through on the other side. 
And of course, we know how the story ends here. It says, And Samuel rose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. He started out with 3,000. So here's the question. Did him taking things into his hands help things at all? No. Not one bit. In fact, they're worse. Nothing's changed. Right. Nothing has changed. In fact, it's worse because now the kingdom has been rent from him and is going to be given unto another. That his kingdom is not going to be established. And it goes on. It says in verse 17, the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies and so on and so forth. And the story doesn't end well. And it says in verse 23, and, uh, and, and the garrison of the Philistines went out uh, to the passage of Michmash. They got even closer. Look, taking things into your own hands doesn't fix anything. It makes things worse. The Philistines just got closer. Right? Go over to Acts chapter 14 and we'll close there. Acts chapter 14. Look, we need to exercise patience in our life. We need to learn to wait on God. And not, you know, the last thing we need to do is hide from the enemy. But look, if we're going to go fight the enemy, you have to understand something, that the enemy is going to fight back. And when that happens, that's not the time to run and hide. That's the time to wait on God. To wait on God to deliver you and not take things into your own hands. Look at, uh, we'll just back up to Acts chapter 14. Look at verse 19. And after there came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who was willing to face opposition, right. why, you know, and, and was willing to go through some persecution in order to serve God, it was Paul. I mean, he's out there preaching, trying to get souls saved, establishing churches. The Jews are following him from this city to that city, persuading people, you know, because they don't want to get their own hands dirty. It's, nothing seems to have changed. Right? They're always just bribing people and get them to do their dirty work. And he says, look, they stoned him, having, supposing that he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when he had preached the gospel to that city, he taught many that they return, and they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. And what did he do when he was making these rounds? Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to not put yourself out there, <laughs> to avoid confrontation, to not make too much of a stink, not don't make waves. Is that what he's doing? No, he's saying, look, to continue in the faith, Amen. to not back down, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Look, if you're going to live the Christian life, you're going to be like Jonathan. If you're going to fight the battle, if you're going to want to make something happen, the enemy's going to notice. The enemy's going to fight. And you know what? You might find yourself in a position where you have to just trust God and wait on God. But here's the thing. You know, you're going to go through much tribulation Yea, and all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not might, not maybe, they shall. You say, well, I'm not going through any persecution. Well, are you living godly in Christ Jesus? Might want to, you know, check that out. But if you are, you're going to go through much tribulation. But keep the end in mind. You know, Samuel was going to show up. If he had just waited a little longer, Samuel showed up, made the peace offerings, the burnt offerings. And you see it in the next chapter. I mean, Jonathan understood it. He said, God is able to save by many or by few. I mean, he, knew this, he, know, you know, he knows the story of Gideon in 300. I mean, he knew that God could go and defeat a great enemy with just a few people. Jonathan had that attitude. He knew the end, and that's why he was willing to go fight and go through whatever tribulation he had to. And look, you are going to go through much tribulation here, just like Paul's exhorting them, but remember what, what you're go, where you're headed. He says you must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That's the end. So whatever tribulation we're going to go through in this life, as bad as it may or may not get, just remember that you're entering into the kingdom of God. Amen. And you probably be, have a lot easier time going through that tribulation, facing that persecution, when you keep the end in mind. And that was Saul's problem. He, couldn't, he got impatient. He couldn't keep the end in sight. That Samuel was going to show up. Let's not be like him. Let's not get impatient. Let's remember that you know, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. We read those verses in Revelation. You know, we're going to be that great crowd that's crying, Hallelujah, you know, glory and praise and honor to our God. And we're going to see him exact vengeance on our enemies. And we're going to praise him for it. You know, if we keep that in mind, then we can be more like Jonathan and less like Saul. Be willing to take on the fight. Be willing to go out there and do something big for God and, and welcome whatever persecution comes our way and take it patiently. Let's go ahead and pray.